Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the July lecture in physics. This is our third lecture out of four. It's the first time you've been coming uh, to the event. Um, my name is Susie Shee. I'm a senior lecturer here in the School of Physics at the University of Melbourne, um, and I work in the field of accelerator physics, and I'm also a science communicator, um, just in case you haven't met me before. Um, and for the last two years, I've been the curator of the July lectures in physics. Um, this series is quite a phenomenal series of lectures, actually. This is the 55th year of running the July lectures in physics. Um, and I, I, sometimes I sort of cast my mind back into what physics looked like 50 years, 55 years ago. Um, and, and really, it's quite incredible that every year, on a Friday evenings in July, people have come out of the cold in Melbourne um, into, into the university, or back to the university if they maybe studied here when they were younger. Um, to come into this space, to join us, to explore fundamental ideas in physics. Uh, so you're very, very welcome, especially if it's the first time, but also, and more than especially, if you've been coming for many years, which I know, I don't know many of you have, so you're very, very welcome. Um, so uh, this, year's, uh, this week's lecture um, is actually going to be about quantum chemistry, and I'll introduce our speaker in one second. Um, if you can click to the next slide for me. Thank you. Um, before I begin, though, I would like to uh, acknowledge that this lecture tonight it is on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, um, and to acknowledge uh, their leaders, past, present, and emerging, and to acknowledge that the indigenous people of this land were the first scientists of this land as well. Um, so, so welcome, especially to anybody uh, of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage, to our event tonight. Um, so, it gives me great pleasure obviously to welcome you, but especially to welcome our speaker this evening. Professor Katja Pass um, is a professor, professor sorry, <laughs> in chemistry at the um, University of Monash, actually. I know it's usual for this series for all of our lecturers to come from Melbourne, but um, I've started reaching out to find incredible lecturers for you uh, from around the city. Um, and now Katja has held just about every, I read her bio, she held just about every prestigious fellowship you <laughs> especially in Australia in, um, in academia. Uh, so I won't list the whole, the whole title, but just to say that Katja is also now um, on the Australian Research Council College of Experts, which gives you um, an understanding of her level of um, expertise and esteem in our academic community. Uh, so it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you tonight Katja Pass, who's going to be speaking about quantum chemistry and the effects of uh, quantum mechanics in materials, in biology, and in our everyday lives. So could you please give a massive round of applause for Professor Gadget Pass? Thank you, Susie, for a lovely introduction. And it's just amazing to see so many people who came out here tonight to listen about quantum chemistry. So let's just hope I will not disappoint you. Um, just a brief outline of my talk, so I'll just tell you why quantum chemistry, why as a quantum chemist I was invited to give uh, a lecture within the physics lecture series. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit more about the basics of quantum chemistry and how it fits in with uh, physics in general. I'll also cover a little bit of a history of quantum chemistry and of course quantum chemistry does not exist without computers so I will also uh, tell you a little bit more how the development uh, in computers actually led to the development in quantum chemistry and also some current challenges that we are facing. I just want to recap what Professor Nicole Bale told us a couple of weeks ago on quantum mechanics and particularly the three guiding principles uh, on particle duality, quantum superposition and Heisenberg principle. And she showed us this whole beautiful world of elementary particles that quantum physics studies. Well, Quantum chemistry is a little bit boring because we just isolate, uh, among all of these particles, we just isolate only three and we really look at proton, neutrons uh, and electrons. In reality, what we do, we study atoms. And if you ask me how many atoms, well, just look at the periodic table. That's how many atoms we study in quantum chemistry. There are currently 103 uh, atoms. Some of them are synthetically synthesized. And really, we're looking at all possible combination of these atoms. And if you think about, well, how do these atoms combine and what sort of materials uh, we make, well, don't go really far 
Just look around you, you're sitting on chairs made of plastics. These are all human-made materials. A fun fact that we make about 30 billion tons of human-made materials annually, and it's forecasted by 2040, human-made materials will outweigh living things by mass, not in quantity, by mass, so outweigh uh, the living materials by 2020. Actually, it's predicted to be tripled by 2040, uh, which is, just tells you how much of materials we synthesize and produce uh, every day, every year, and this is exactly what we are studying in quantum chemistry. Let's just look at our beautiful city of Melbourne, all of the materials surrounding us, concrete, glass, you know, beautiful buildings, neon lights. So this is all made of materials that we study in quantum chemistry. And if we look deep down at the atoms that comprise these materials, we look at, you know, concrete, we we look at silicon, oxygen, iron, calcium, aluminium, hydrogen. Then we have glass, so also add uh, sodium and carbon, steel, neon lights, so, and the list keeps on growing. When it actually, you know, if we just look at the intersection, busy intersection at Flinders Station, just people like us, you know, we see a lot of diversity, but actually what is very, very surprising among all of that diversity, we can narrow it down to only a number of atoms. So really when we look at our skin, at our hair, or proteins, or DNA that comprise us, really we're looking at a very limited number of atoms. So the majority of us, really, it comes down to these five or six essential atoms like carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur. Of course, we have all other atoms present in our body, but they are present in, very, in trace amounts. And it surprises me, right? So you're thinking really that at a handful of atoms, out of 103 atoms available to us on the periodic table, you only have a handful of atoms. And you just look at the audience, right? This is what they produce, a big variety of combinations, physical features and uh, attributes. And that's really exciting. And that's what really what excited me when I was a young girl uh, about uh, quantum chemistry. When was, was born? Uh, when was the field born? It was actually born in 1926 uh, with the seminal work by Erwin Schrodinger, who published the wave equation and who really showed us how to predict the properties of atoms and molecules. And his original equation contained uh, the time dimension, so it was a uh, four-dimensional equation. But the good news about chemical system is that we can get rid of that time dimension because in reality, time means that chemical systems evolve over time. Well, think about water that your ancestors drank a hundred of years ago. It had exactly the same properties as the water that we drink now. Of course, the water is more polluted now. We have pollutants everywhere, but pure water has exactly the same properties. And that's really good news for us because then we can get rid of the time component and start solving Schrodinger's equation. So we're really uh, in the field of the time independent equation. I also have to say that sometimes there are chemical processes in which you cannot get rid of time. You actually need to introduce that, but I'm not going to cover those processes in my talk. What about the term quantum chemistry? Uh, actually, it's interesting that uh, the field of quantum chemistry as an independent discipline took a while to be established. And we were called different names, from mathematical chemistry to chemical physics. And recently, just a couple of years ago, there was this really nice book published on uh, a history of quantum chemistry where we were called neither chemistry nor physics. So they kind of place us in between chemistry and physics. And of course, without physics and chemistry, quantum chemistry would not exist because it's physicists who established a lot of uh, fundamentals and basics for us, but it was chemists who also drove the field because they said, I want to study that material or that material. Could you please provide us with solutions? And we also would not survive without mathematicians uh, and computer scientists, because computers play an important part in quantum chemistry, and hopefully I'll explain to you why. So what really quantum chemistry does, it studies materials. Materials that are human-made, materials that are naturally occurring. 
naturally occurring materials, something like proteins and DNA, that consist really of a handful of atoms that give us this amazing property. And that what constantly amazes me is just a handful of atoms and we have all of these properties. But of course, we also um, like to study uh, man-made materials and we like to actually predict the properties of potential uh, man-made or human-made materials. Like for example, graphene and the structure of graphene that we now use as uh, electrodes to power our uh, devices, for example, you know, smartphones or laptops. But Nicole told you, Professor Nicole Bale told you about the Schrodinger's cat paradox, and I like those thought experiments. I always love them because, you know, they are kind of our way to explain uh, things that we don't quite understand. Well, let me introduce you the quantum chemistry paradox the way I understand it. So on one hand, we deal with atoms. Remember, atoms consist of elementary particles. So we have nuclei that consist of pro pro that are formed by protons and uh, neutrons, but we also have electrons revolving around them, so, right? The atoms form molecules, but then molecules become three-dimensional objects, and they actually move in space <coughs> obeying Newtonian mechanics. And this is where it becomes a little bit of a conundrum, right? So we're dealing with objects that on the atomic level are quantum, but yet we observe them in real life, so then they behave also like us as three-dimensional objects. And really it's the combination of the two what makes quantum chemistry shine. So are atoms complicated? Well, Let's face it, we only have three elementary particles. How complicated can they be, right? Well, actually, they are complicated because even just for a single molecule, like the water molecule here that only has one oxygen and two hydrogen atoms, suddenly we deal with three nuclei and 10 electrons. When we deal with nuclei, that's very simple, right? That's just Coulomb's law. When we have um, the multiplication of the charges on the nuclei divided by the distance, so they repel each other. That's all very simple, right? So, and you might tell me, you know, well, that's not very complicated. Well, the complexity comes from the electrons. And in our field, we also use the Born-Oppenheimer approximation that allows us to separate the movements of electrons from the nuclei. And usually I tell my students, if you ask a question, to write Schrodinger's equation, you also need to ask which one you would like me to write. Would you like me to write the electronic Schrodinger equation when we only talk about the properties of electrons of the nuclear Schrodinger equation? And just a fun fact that Max Born was actual grandfather of uh, Olivia Newton-John. The audience always finds it exciting. Uh, so, the reason for why we can separate the motions of electrons and the nuclei is because nuclei are so much heavier than the electrons. So we can assume as the nuclei move, the electrons adopt the new position of the nuclei almost instantaneously. And that makes our life as quantum chemists significantly easier because then we can separate the wave function of the electron from the wave function of the nuclei. And that also allows us to solve Schrodinger's equation for large systems. When it comes to electrons, the situation becomes slightly more difficult because electrons, again, are attracted very strongly to the nuclei because electrons are negatively charged, nuclei are positively charged, and this one of the strongest interactions in the universe. And yet think about it, electrons are negatively charged, right? So what do they want? They want to avoid each other. But somehow they find peace within the atom. So somehow they manage to avoid each other and even get additional stabilization energy from that. And this is what's called electron correlation. So when electrons actually correlate each other motion so that they avoid bumping into each other because they repel each other. And yet they maintain their positions in the atoms because they're strongly attracted to the nuclei. Many quantum chemists like the analogy of the traffic lights, how electrons avoid appearing in the same place. I don't like that analogy. I like the analogy like, think about your fancy building you would like to live in. So that's one of my favorite buildings, the Danson Building in Prague. 
You want to live in that fancy buildings, but you don't want to meet your neighbors. What do you do? You understand their schedule and you make sure that you never bump into them, right? And I, I love that episode from Science Held, uh, uh, Kiss Hello, when they decided that they need to uh, kiss hello each other and Jerry said, no, I'm not doing that. So I am thinking about electron correlation is like, you really wanna stay in that fancy building, so that's your positively charged nuclei, and you want to avoid all of your numbers. And electron correlation represents a huge problem for us because think about the Coulomb's law, that's the one that drives it, so it's a two electron function. And we have another problem. Electrons are indistinguishable in the atoms. And what actually we need to do in order to account for electron correlation, we need to look at all possible permutations of two electrons interacting with each other. And that becomes a huge problem because as our system grows and we have more and more electrons in the system, it becomes challenging computationally to solve it. And this is what we called uh, then a many body program, problem in our case. Let me just uh, briefly tell you about the history of quantum chemistry. So uh, as I mentioned before, 1926, that's when Schrodinger published his wave equation. And just right after that, there was a very nice piece of work published on the chemical bonding of the hydrogen molecule. And in that particular work, this is where the term electron pairing was coined. So this one, the chemical bond was explained through the pairing of two electrons. And then uh, Douglas Hartree, who was a physicist, came along and he helped us understand the many body problem. And what he said, well, instead of asking and looking at one electron interacting with another and looking at all of the possible permutation, why don't we consider it as an average field? And this was his contribution to actually analyze the electrostatic interaction in the system. Unfortunately, he made a mistake. He forgot a very simple term that uh, it took Vladimir Fock to publish uh, the additional term, which is called exchange operator and that Basically, within the um, douglas hartree theory, electron can see itself and can interact with itself, which is, of course, physically not right. And it was Vladimir Falk who then introduced the exchange operator uh, and that uh, the component of the electron seeing itself got taken out. And it was also in 1928 was when the molecular orbital concept was uh, also introduced. And that concept is particularly important to us and I will cover it in detail a little bit later. And also about, I think, 10 years later, that's when uh, Linus Pauling published uh, a number of books on the nature of the chemical bond. And for that reason, he was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize 20 years later. And then, of course, another contribution came in 1950. This is where uh, it was confirmed that the linear combination of atomic orbitals, so remember, molecules consist of atoms, so you can then actually take atomic orbitals, combine them linearly, form molecular orbitals, uh, and solve Schrodinger's equation this way. And this was also at the time when the term ab initio was introduced, which means from the very beginning, so that's when we saw Schrodinger's equation without any help of empirical data, so we only use fundamental constants. Of course, we go hand in hand with computers, so that was all really all of the work done sort of on, uh, you know, with paper and pen. But it's only in 1951 when the first general purpose computer appeared. That's when uh, all publications on the ab initio calculations of complicated molecules started to appear. At first it was just diatomic molecules, such as uh, the nitrogen. And then of course the theory started to develop even further. So um, there was in 1964, that's when the density functional theory was born. So instead of um, looking at molecular orbitals, it looked at the electron density of the molecule and solved Schrodinger's equation uh, that way. And then of course, 1970, this is when the first commercial software in quantum chemistry appeared, Gauss in 70. Uh, and really John Popple was the one uh, who founded 
this software was one of the founders of this software, and he was really a genius. And we owe him, as quantum chemists, we owe him a debt of gratitude because at the time we still didn't know how to solve Schrodinger's equation efficiently, so without having to wait years and years on end. So what he did, he actually said, look, we can, because we can take atomic orbitals, take the linear combinations to make molecular orbitals, why don't we introduce something what's called basis sets? Basis sets, they are functions that are solutions of Schrodinger's equation for hydrogen-like atoms. So where you take an atom and you only leave one electron at a time. So you don't have electron correlation, right? So you get rid of that. You just simply have electrostatic interaction. You can solve Schrodinger's equation, extract the functions, and then use them as basis sets to form your molecular orbitals. And that's what's genius, because that allowed us to write efficient quantum chemical packages that people could use on the computers at the time and start solving you know, chemistry-related questions and actually look at more complicated sorry, at more complicated molecules. And of course in 1971 that was when the first commercially available microprocessor uh, was released and guess what, that's when the field started to explode. So between 1990 and 2022, so the number of publications and commercial av commercially available software as well as free of charge software just exploded. And it also coincided with in the period of 1980 to 1990, this is when IBM and Apple released personal computers. And really after that, many people could install quantum chemical software on their laptops. That's what exact, on, on, on their personal computers. That's exactly what I did when I was a bachelor's student. So they could run these calculations overnight. And I still remember a sigh of relief that my mother gave when she said, I oh, thank God you finished and I don't have to listen to that computer because Remember all these old computers had fans in them and mine worked 24 seven solving Schrodinger's equation just for a five atom molecule. So really in the end now, we contributed a significant amount of scientific outputs based on quantum chemistry software. We do have uh, three uh, Nobel prizes that went to quantum chemists. So one was, of course, to Linus Pauling for understanding the chemical bond. And, you know, it took a few years on the development of computers. So it's, it's not until 1998 when John Popple and Walter Kohn were awarded uh, their Nobel Prize. And really it was for the development of ab initio methods or quantum chemical methods. And really the progress that they brought to the field was really allowing us to solve Schrodinger's equation for single molecules. And that was really a huge outcome. And then it took 15 years for Martin Kaplau, Saria Washel, and Michael Levitt to also be awarded Nobel Prize in quantum chemistry. Well, it's in chemistry, but they're quantum chemists. So uh, there is no, of course, Nobel Prize in quantum chemistry. Um, but they, uh, their Nobel Prize went for the introduction of the Newtonian equations of motion to understand the properties of materials. Remember how I mentioned to you that on the atomic level, of course, molecules are quantum, but they form these big structures that actually obey the Newtonian mechanics in the end. And what they did, they kind of ignored the quantum part, so they approximated it using some analytical formulas that we call force fields, and then they introduced the Newtonian equation of motions in order to understand properties of really large systems, for example, dynamics of proteins. And this is where, uh, so the way I call it, this was really a Nobel Prize for the development of molecular dynamics. Let me just address the elephant in the room, molecular orbitals. Um, I'm always asked this question because people want to believe they're real. Well, look at them, right? So molecular orbitals consist of, uh, they are linear combinations of, at uh, sorry, atomic orbitals. And look how pretty they look, right? So you have all of these spherical atomic orbitals, the S-type, you have the dumbbells, these are the P-type, 
Then you have the double dumbbell, the D-type. I mean, I love teaching students this stuff. They're just very pretty, and students usually get excited about that. And of course, we can solve Schrodinger's equation for hydrogen-like atom. We can extract all of these atomic orbitals, and then we can start forming molecular orbitals for a molecule like this, right? So if we know atomic orbitals on each individual atom, just a linear combination of those in order to produce molecular orbital. And of course, the question I'm always asked, are molecular orbitals real? And believe it or not, many scientists are still trying to find them experimentally. So here is one of the paper, papers uh, which was published in Science in uh, 2009, where they were trying to extract, um, reconstruct, sorry, molecular orbitals from photo excitation spectra. So where they basically took this uh, sexy phenyl uh, molecule, they excited it, and then using the electron density of that excitation, they could reconstruct molecular orbitals. And you can see, so here in figure A, so these are the experimental results. Uh, in figure B, these are the theoretical results. And you see there are kind of sort of similarities, right? But the experiment sort of places the electron mostly in the middle of the molecule. Whereas, remember, if you're doing the linear combination of atomic orbitals in this case, and it's a very conjugated molecule, what's going to happen? The electron will be spread all over the molecule, right? It's not going to find a position on one atom or the other. It actually will be spread across the whole molecule. So my answer to this question about the reality of molecular orbitals is no, they are not real. Electron density is. But molecular orbitals are a very nice mathematical concept that was introduced for us to solve Schrodinger's equation. There could have been someone else, not John Popol, but someone else who would come along and say, hey, we could solve Schrodinger's equation this way. And instead of talking molecular orbitals, we would be talking about something else. You know, there was, a, for example, a theory about uh, integrals, you know, a different way of solving Schrodinger's equation. And instead of molecular orbitals, we would be talking about something else. But it doesn't mean that people are not trying still to find uh, molecular orbitals in real life. Let me just talk now about size of the systems that we can study. And I kind of want to put it already in perspective with the terminology that I introduced. Remember Ab initio, that's the Nobel Prize, the first, kind of the second Nobel Prize uh, in quantum chemistry. So when we deal with um, very accurate methods, but for solving single molecules. So really talking about very small systems that we can run on a very short time scale. And then, of course, molecular dynamics was introduced, so that's when we could include an ensemble of molecules and start looking at the dynamics of these molecules in time. So we could look not only increase the size of the systems, but also the time uh, scale of the systems as well. And um, the detail was a bit lost because we could not really solve Schrodinger's equation for every single individual atom, so we had to cut corners. So that's when we introduced this analytical formulation of the interactions in the system uh, together with the Newtonian mechanics. And then the way I like to explain you know, the further systems, how you can actually increase the size of your system. Well, if you like impressionists, right? So you know, if you come close, you kind of see all the strokes. You, know, you take a few steps back, and we kind of start seeing a picture right, evolving. And that's exactly the same way. You, know, you take molecular dynamic simulation, you step back, you know, maybe five meters, and then suddenly you, know, you kind of see that some atoms become a blur, and they form a bead. And you just go, all right, I'll just you know, make this collection of atoms one bead and reduce the cost of my simulations. And this is what really coarse grain methods are all about. And then again, step further back, go away 20 meters from that painting, right? And suddenly it all looks like a surface. And it becomes a continuum model. And this is what the continuum models are like. Unfortunately, as we increase the time scale and the length scale of our simulations, we have to do a lot of compromises because the computation power is not increasing as fast as we would like. And therefore, of course, the accuracy significantly reduces. And there is only so much that we can predict. Ideally, what I would like to do, I would like for us to be able to combine Abinishim D, and we can, 
but it requires upscale high-end computers uh, to do that and really be able to do very large system on a very large time scale so we can understand what the proteins do inside our body but also how the materials behave in time so we can predict their properties. And really I think this is the target that we have already achieved in some ways, but again, in this case, we require supercomputers to do that. And, you know, going back to purple, um, I think it was a fun time being in the 70s because so many things were developed and that's when the first computers, uh, you know, commercially available computers appeared. And I thought, you know, I would love to live in those times because there was so much to do, so much to understand, but also they gave us so many rules that are still valid. And this was purple diagram. So he basically said that if we want to achieve the exact solution of Schrodinger's equation, what do we need to do? Remember how we solve Schrodinger's equation for atoms to get basis sets, in, and then we include them to form molecular orbitals? Well, he said if you keep increasing, the basis set size and make it infinite. And if you also keep increasing on how you describe electron, the complexity of the electron correlation of the system, so the better you describe it, then you will start achieving the exact solution. Of course, that's just not possible for the realistic systems because the system we would like to study are too large. So we can do that for very limited systems, but uh, not for all. And the problem is also because our methods do not scale as well. So uh, here is one of the uh, methods that account accurately for electron correlation. And if we take one benzene ring, yeah, it takes only a couple of minutes, great. But as we start increasing the number of benzene ring in the systems, it might take our actual asset a few days to perform that calculation. And as you can see, that's not a very big system. If we want to study something that consists of a thousand atoms, well, how long do we have to wait years? And might not even be able to do that. So in reality, what we want to do in quantum chemistry is to be able to study large systems to incorporate ab initio together with MD uh, and achieve it for really large systems. And people have done that. So here is the first example. Uh, a paper published in Science 2010. Uh, this was by David Shaw, who, you know, is a multimillionaire who went, uh, who worked on Wall Street, made a lot of money, and then decided to teach himself quantum chemistry, built his own computational center, hired 20 plus people because he really wanted to understand the dynamics of proteins, and he ended up uh, publishing in Science, and he performed very first millisecond simulation of proteins. At the time, we could only do simulations on the nanoscale, so multiplied by a thousand times, so, uh, so not a thousand, 10 to the power of six, so millisecond simulation of the protein. And that was amazing, and that was spectacular. But the guy dedicated his, all, his whole life just to do that one calculation to make the codes really fast. The second one is, uh, which I find absolutely fascinating. So there was this uh, idea in the field that diamonds are not actually formed just from fossils, you know, not just simply dead dinosaurs, but actually something else contributes to that. And there was this idea that actually under certain conditions, rocks that consist of minerals can leach out these minerals and then into the seawater. And those minerals can then start forming diamonds. And there was this uh, very, very expensive ab initio MD simulation performed at high temperature and pressure uh, with water, sea water, in the presence of various metal ions and the minerals from rocks. And what they realized that the carbonate ion can leach out from rocks. And under this high pressure and temperature, it can actually start decomposing, forming carbon-carbon bonds, and that's exactly how diamonds are formed. And in the end, this work was published in Science 2015, where they had experimental evidence for that happening. And that's kind of fascinating, right? Who thought that rocks, water, high pressure and temperature had to do anything with diamonds? And then the last contribution I wanted to share 
is actually done by uh, Laura Gagliardi, uh, who is uh, one of the leading quantum chemists in the field. And she looked at the materials for uh, carbon capture. So there are these unique porous materials. We call them metal organic frameworks. Basically, you introduce some organic molecules, metal ions, and in solution, they assemble into these porous structures that are very cool because here the gray sphere shows you the size of the pore in that material. And think about it, all of the small molecules that carbon dioxide can easily diffuse through assemble layers so we can capture carbon dioxide. And her contribution was she could perform very high-end ab initio MD simulations. And so they are shown here in the uh, uh, red squares. And she basically reproduced the experimental results that are shown here uh, in the blue circles. And that again uh, show a case that we can use these high-end applications to predict the properties of these very complicated materials. We can actually start designing and discovering new materials without the need to go into the lab. Unfortunately, these calculations are still very high end. And my students know that we write grants every year in order to receive more and more time on the supercomputer so we can afford doing these calculations. And I think really where the field is going now is all about not just trying to simplify the methods that we have. I think we kind of need to change our tact. We know we can do very highly accurate calculations. Yes, they require supercomputers, but we can use these calculations, we can use supercomputers to produce reliable data. So instead of going to, to do it in the experimentally, we can do it on the computers, we can create large data sets that can start fitting into machine learning approaches that are fast, can be made accurate if we have very large data sets and I think that will really be the future. So as quantum chemists, we'll probably be defined as quantum machine learning chemists or something. We're just not going to be quantum chemists. And by the way, I'm not alone in my opinion. So just a couple of weeks ago, I wrote these slides. I showed them to Susie. And at the time, as I was showing them to Susie, actually, there was this talk at the prestigious theoretical chemistry uh, in Vancouver. And uh, Professor Old Hoffman, who was a Nobel Prize winner in 1981, basically said, well, 2022, that's the death of quantum chemistry. Because with all of the machine learning approaches that are fast and can be made accurate, uh, really, most likely, quantum chemistry will have to redefine itself and will have to find a different niche. And I agree with that because I think, you know, the more data sets we have, and the more accurate solutions we have, we can start producing really fast machine learning approaches. And we can really uh, speed up the process of material discovery. And where the field is currently at and what I'm also working on is using the GPU technology. All the gamers in the room, so you know all the graphic cards, right? So why do you like them? Because you can have objects in 3D that have high resolution, and when you jump from one building to another, that resolution doesn't blur, right? So it remains the same. So we actually use graphic cards to write quantum chemical uh, software to make it significantly faster. Uh, and then we can make our calculations fast and accurate. And that's exactly what I'm doing with my collaborator, Dr. Giuseppe Bacca at the ANU. So our least recent achievement, we calculated a system of 500,000 atoms, which is about 140 angstroms in diameter. Of course, we needed to use the whole summit, uh, which is a supercomputer in Oak Ridge uh, National Laboratory. So we could do this calculation within just a couple of hours if we uh, use the whole of the supercomputer, uh, but we can still do it. And now we have actually this un unprecedented result when we have information of the solution of Schrodinger's equation for this very large system. Um, just a couple of more exciting examples from my group. 
uh, uh, and how we use quantum chemistry to solve real chemistry problems. I always tell my students, um, and they know that I'm not lying when I say, I want to make contribution to the world. I don't want just to be a quantum chemist who goes to work and solve Schrodinger's equation. I actually want to give solutions to real world problems. So when this problem came to me, so Professor Benny Freeman from University of Texas at Austin came to me and he said, you know that no one understands the structure of polydopamine. Let me just preface that by talking about muscles. Muscles are very unique because they produce this amazing protein that allows them to touch to rocks so strongly that it's very hard to detach them. It requires significant force to do that. And this is because they have these uh, catechol molecules within this protein that have very strong adhesive properties. And you see it has the benzene ring, and then it also has two hydroxyl groups. So chemists said, okay, let's just take dopamine, looks very similar, let's polymerize it, just put it in water, just add a couple of more ingredients, nothing really much, and hey, they just produce this amazing polymer, which has very strong adhesive properties, can adhere to any surface. And the reason for why engineers love it is because it withstands corrosion, it has anti-fouling properties, and it cannot be solubilized in any non-organic solvent man. And that's why no one could understand the structure, because you cannot dissolve it, you cannot actually perform high resolution characterization experiments. So my collaborator came to me and he said, can you do something about it? Well, we actually use quantum chemical calculations in order to predict a magic solvent. A magic solvent that can dissolve this uh, polymer, dissolve this coating so we could understand the properties to the point that now we can polymerize any amine that contains this uh, cat catechol moiety and we can produce these polymers in solution and then we can coat various types of surfaces and we can make them hydrophobic, hydrophilic, whatever you like. But again, without the quantum chemistry and the calculations we perform and understanding what it takes to dissolve this polymer, we would not be able to resolve this problem. Another one in my group are very much interested in organic batteries, moving away from lithium-ion batteries. Why? Because I think the reality of it is that we still do not know how to recycle them. We will run out of lithium and in the end we need to find better solutions. So instead of using lithium-ion in order to uh, run our battery, we looked at some organic molecules, in this case uh, nitroxide radicals that uh, can also run our batteries. The problem with these radicals, they can easily oxidize, beautiful, but no one could reduce them and, and uh, maintain the anion. So that's the anion that's produced when you reduce uh, this radical because this anion is so reactive, it starts attacking all of the solvents, electrolytes, uh, and basically you quench uh, the whole uh, electrochemical process. Again, using quantum chemical calculations, we managed to design, design solvents that can stabilize this anion, and we were the first one, you know, the first group in the world who could actually synthesize this aminoxyanion and make it stable for a very long time. Uh, and that's quite exciting. The reason for why we're excited about this is because we're thinking that we can now make these batteries very large. So really my goal is, can we actually produce these very big batteries that can be recycled when we build our houses, we put them in the walls of our houses, they can power our houses. We don't have to think about all lithium and batteries, we have to recycle them somehow, get rid of them, buy new ones, da 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 da. So, um, and I think this is what really the future houses will look like. Uh, based on some type of uh, organic batteries. Just a couple of still unresolved issues in the field, something that you might be excited about. Remember how I talked to you about electron correlation? Well, we still do not know how to um, understand strong electron correlation, the one that can actually change uh, the properties of materials. Materials from quantum computing, we need to understand that if we want to 
design better materials, we need to understand how to resolve that issue. Uh, and of course, uh, magnetism and superconductivity uh, as well. Uh, relativistic effects, so remember uh, the Schrodinger equation, Schrodinger's equation only included sort of the basic information about the electrons, but it did not directly include its spin. So and that's when we need to look at the Dirac's formulation that also incorporate electron spin uh, into the equation if we want to understand properties of some materials, for example, mercury completely relativistic effects, it's liquid, but if you use Schrodinger's equation, you predict it as solid, which is of course not true, and that's because of the relativistic effects. And another one, which I think is very close to my heart, uh, because if we really want to understand uh, chemical biology, chemical catalysis, we also need to tackle one more issue. Remember how I said to you we can separate the emotions of electrons and the nuclei? Well, if your nuclei are protons, they're actually quite small. And they can interfere and couple with the motion of the electrons. So in reality, if you're dealing with uh, proton transfer reactions in um, our bodies or in chemical catalysis, you need to then start including the wave function of the proton and the wave function of the electrons in the same equation. And that's what complicates the whole thing. And we're yet to actually come up with uh, realistic solutions for that. So quite a few challenges still there. Um, and of course, I would not be able to do that without my amazing students. So thank you, the Monash Computation Chemistry Group, uh, past and present, who are also here in the audience. Um, I also need to give big thanks to supercomputers. My work would not be able, as I said, I'm doing something that requires supercomputer power. Otherwise, you know, I would be stuck with Solomon Schroeder's equation for diatomic molecules, which I don't want to. Uh, so supercomputers, the national computation infrastructure, also the Stampede, so that's the uh, Texas, uh, Texan computer uh, cluster, uh, and that's through my collaboration with Professor Benny Freeman. Big thanks to Monash Research Center and the massive facility. They are the biggest supporters of our work. Without them, we probably would not be able to survive because we have crazy ideas. We want to run crazy calculations, and they're always there uh, to help us. And most of all, thank you for your uh, attention. And I'm more than happy to answer your questions. Well, I mean, it's, it's sort of borderline in a philosophical question as well. Um, I, we cannot ask, uh, answer the question why exactly adenines, um, guanidine, uh, that they. Yes, we, we cannot really answer that why question. Why could? Why not more? Uh, at the moment, uh, it's very hard for us. 
I mean, as chemists the, uh, and as quantum chemists, we can design crazy materials. So you know how DNA folds? So we can actually come up with various types of other molecules that can fold in a similar way and have similar properties. I guess uh, you're asking me whether we can really understand the nature. The only thing I can tell you is that I think it was in 2010, Todd Martinez, uh, also a famous quantum chemist, published this work. I believe it was in Nature or Nature Chemistry. I'm looking at my students, they, maybe they remember that. Uh, where essentially what they did, you know, they sort of looked at why amino acids, you know, why are they the building blocks of life? What they did, they uh, had a simulation box. They threw just very simple gases like carbon monoxide, hydrogen, uh, oxygen, um, I think they had the ammonia as well. And what they did, they kind of simulated how the Earth developed during the early times, you know, went through periods of high pressure, high temperature, then the pressure would drop, temperature would drop. So they simulated that, and you know what? By magic, all of this amino acids started to pop up. So it is, yeah. but we know we can see them in space, there was just a recent paper, I think, I think it just was a couple of weeks ago, where they uh, found the traces of uh, amino acids in space as well. Why amino acids? We do not know. Thank you. Thank you. The next person is over here. Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for the lecture. Uh, I just have a quick question regarding like, uh, the, how it's machine learning used for simulation. Like, because uh, as far as my limited understanding about machine learning goes, uh, all kinds of model, existing model of training and stuff that requires a lot of existing data with no answer. Uh, but uh, but like as you mentioned, we we want to get an accurate simulation using the more like traditional model. It takes a long time, expensive. Uh, how do we? How is large number like how it's like more yeah. training? that's a that's an excellent question. Um, and and I think what uh, I think that needs to be emphasized that we still need the accurate data, right? So we can spend decades in the lab producing the data, but we can put supercomputers to work, and if we can have faster codes that implement, that have state-of-the-art quantum chemical methods, we can actually start solving Schrodinger's equation for these very large systems and creating bigger and bigger data sets, right? So we actually create more points that are accurate and then we can use then these points in the machine learning to make them accurate as well. Because, you know, if your data has an error of plus minus 10 kilojoules per mole, you will introduce that error in your machine learning. So why don't we focus on producing this very high-end calculations with a very small error so then we can use it in machine learning. And I think it kind of works both ways, right? So we will start then, um, speed accelerating the discovery of uh, new materials. And also we'll learn how to run this calculation faster. As I said, with my collaborator, we could do 500,000 atoms, right? When I did my bachelor's, I could hardly do five atom molecule, right? I mean, now I'm doing 500,000 atoms, which is amazing. And I think, you know, um, we have those states of the art methods that we can use so we can produce reliable data so then we can also drive the reliable machine learning models. Right, thank you very much. Okay, next question. Over here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what is your opinion about the contributions of the various particle physics theories on practical computational chemistry and development of new materials. Do you have any, any opinion on that? I have an opinion only from the point of helping us with methodologies. You know, for example, density functional theory, without physicists, it wouldn't even exist. And it was, you know, Thomas Fermi who introduced the very first equation of how to relate the electron density with the uh, energy of the uh, electrons. And it's only because of them and all the physicists 
uh, we started uh, using those formulations in chemistry. Of course, it took a chemist to realize where physicists went wrong, because physicists like very nice spherical particles, you know, that behave really well. And then I remember Axel Becker said, hang on, remember we have carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, they're not equal, and therefore you need to account for that. You know what he did? He introduced electron density gradient. And not allowed to suddenly solve that electron, uh, the density functional theory equations for chemical systems. And the whole field was born overnight. And suddenly everyone was starting buzzing, you know, like, oh my God, now we can use something very simple as the electron density to solve Schrodinger's equation. And I remember the the whole buzz because I was doing my PhD and you know you wake up every day someone else would come up with a new functional you know oh now you can use this and you can use in this correction and that correction it was exciting it was really exciting I think it was really owing to physicists and I also would like to say huge thanks to mathematicians you know sometimes we used things like Slater determinant in quantum chemistry without mathematicians <laughs> yeah. I think it's really good to see this connection between. Oh, absolutely. Ab absolutely. Like yeah. Joke, I didn't wake up every day in my PhD getting excited about new equations, so I got excited about new, new yeah. experimental things. But it's, it's lovely to see. Yeah. Um, I was always, of course, on the other end. I always wanted to solve Schrodinger's equation very accurately. And I always wanted to. Though. Yeah, to use as more computers as I could to actually push the boundaries, yeah. <laughs> Proteins are long strings of amino acids. How close are we to solving a protein structure just knowing the amino acid sequence? Oh, I, I think, you know, now we have even experimental techniques uh, that we can do it very well. I think we can go to below a three angstrom resolution if I understand that correctly. So that's no longer a problem. Dynamics is. So the actual structure is not. Because remember, you freeze it in time and you resolve it. Beautiful. The problem is what happens when you put this structure in your own body? You have different temperature, sodium ions, chloride ions floating around, you have water. It's actually understanding the dynamics of the proteins and the amino acid sequence and what it does under these conditions. You know, the design of drugs is easy in lab. You know how many times they scream, Eureka, you know, we now have very good drug because it binds so strongly. And then they start performing clinical trials. And only, you know, 20% of the discovered drugs in the lab make it in the clinical trials because we don't understand the dynamics. And this is when we need to introduce external parameters in order to understand that. That's an excellent question. And you know, the whole field is moving towards that way. So we can study surfaces uh, very well. And again, it's the physicists who gave us the formulations and the understanding uh, of that. Uh, we can perform very simple chemical reactions. We can do excited states, and that's what photosynthesis uh, will require us to do. Um, there are some publications where people are doing models. Unfortunately, it, it becomes again very complicated because you have to combine the medium explicitly. So not just say, oh, I have it in water. You actually need to introduce those water molecules um, as part of your simulation. And, and remember, more electrons you have, your system starts to explode. Um, and we also need to run it for longer times. And I think this is exactly where the field is moving. Photocatalysis, photosynthesis, really understanding uh, what happens now. We have snippets of it now. We haven't resolved it yet, but we're moving in the right direction there. I hope that answers your question. I'm just wondering, Roger Penrose had a conjecture that the microtubules in the human brain operate in some sort of quantum effect, a sort of creating consciousness. 
That sounds like a chemical quantum interaction. Any comments with that at all? Uh, yeah. I'm not an expert, unfortunately. Um, I, I have um, seen this problem, and I uh, have read about that. <sighs> It's a whole different level of complexity, in my opinion, because that's when you need to start looking at very large systems. I mean, I'm looking at 140 angstroms, you know, which is 40 nanometers, right? You're talking about significantly longer uh, systems. Uh, and at the moment, that's still limitation. So the only way we can look at these systems are using very rough approximation, something like coarse grain. But they're not really the answer because they're not giving us the right energetics, and therefore we cannot really make the right predictions. We can understand what happens in experiment, but we can't really use it as a powerful prediction, unfortunately, yet. So my question is regarding, I want to understand more about the electron correlation. Yes. So I want to understand what's the major problem is it the speed or is it the computation, like the accuracy of the predictions? It's the accuracy of the predictions, yeah. So like, can quantum computing, you think, can solve the problem? Oh, gosh. I'm not an expert again. Um, and that's a totally, uh, I guess, different field. So for us, um, in order to, we know how to uh, predict electron correlation well. Uh, we know that if we include uh, better approximations, we can get to the exact solution. That's not a problem. So for us, in the end, it's do we have enough computer power? That is not just the power, it's do we have enough memory? Can we actually run it in RAM? Can we uh, run these calculations on the time scale, on our time scale, right? So that won't take us hundreds of years, but only maybe a couple of months um, in this case. So. Um, as we, of course, increase the size of the system, we have more and more electrons, and therefore the effect of the electron uh, correlation also increases. In terms of the quantum computing, I kind of almost want to say, well, Harry, help. Maybe you can answer that question for me. Um, with quantum chemistry, what we need to do, we need to produce precise numbers, and sometimes we need up to the eighth, ninth, even tenth decimal places. And if you think about the quantum computing, right, um, so how to achieve that number with that high accuracy, I think this is where the problem occurs. So the noise in quantum computing is uh, what doesn't allow us to do that yet, uh, but I hope that in the future it will allow to overcome the noise issue and get us to the right solutions. And hey, apparently, you know, I read on the IBM website, so where, you know, when they had just only a few quibits, and that was kind of a big thing, that was a couple of years ago, one of the processes they really wanted to study is the Haber-Bosch process. And that's how we produce ammonia uh, in industry. So we liquefy nitrogen and hydrogen to produce ammonia. Uh, and because, you know, 80% of the food in the world is produced using fertilizers. Ammonia is the integral part of the synthesis of fertilizers. They said, let's work out how to make this process less energy intensive. And I'm still waiting on them to be able to do that. <laughs> and, and it's a lovely uh, place to end as well with um, you know, that, that really curiosity-driven research questions and the way that different areas of science also push each other to really push our technology, to push our understanding, um, and the result of the process, you know, regularly changes our world, uh, usually for the better. So um, I'm sure there are a couple of other questions in the audience. Um, I hope Katya might have a couple more minutes if anybody would like to come and Absolutely. have a question with her afterwards. Um, but otherwise, could you please give Katya a massive round of applause? Thank you so much, Susie. Thank you.